Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the Healthy Indoors Show. I'm your host, Bob Krell, publisher of Healthy Indoors Magazine. Uh, we've got a great show coming up today. Uh, with me, as usual, in the co-pilot seat is Joe Medosh. Our, our guest uh, today uh, is going to be, uh, it's, it's unique in that we're actually having one of our uh, regular uh, columnists from Healthy Indoor Magazine as a guest. I, go figure. We actually thought to go to our own stable of people that right, right in our own ecosystem, actually invite them on our show. It's supposed to go on outwards and looking for people. You know, what can I say? So anyway, Nate Adams, uh, Nate's the founder of energy, smart home performance in Cleveland, Ohio. And, uh, he, and of Nate, the house whisperer.com rather than focus on energy efficiency. Nate focuses on solving the root causes of client problems, like uncomfortable rooms, mold, wet basements, and icicles. As a fan of uh, radical transparency, he has published the most detailed case studies in the industry on these projects. And he continues to do that on a monthly basis for Healthy Indoors Magazine. And we just reminded him that he has his next article due. So welcome, <laughs> Nate. How are you, bud? I'm doing good. I'll have part five out soon. <laughs> yeah, I, well, you have to because the magazine's coming out soon. And, <laughs> exactly. and, and, and again, from Hayward's score, you know, the amiable and, uh, uh, you know, some, sometimes surprising Joe Medosh. Okay. <laughs> That's me. You know, so I, yeah, today's, yeah, yeah, today I, I'm excited about today because we're talking about something that works for homeowners and contractors all in one discussion. So we've had a uh, we've been challenged to try and figure out how to meet that goal. So that's our focus today is that your your mom and your HVAC contractor can both understand what Nate wants to explain to you as to how to make your system work more efficiently. It it is funny. That's uh, so with with Nate the house whisperer in general. Um, it, it's meant to span both because we're, we're working on this HVAC 2.0 program uh, for HVAC contractors. So our, our main goal is to provide really good experiences for both contractors and homeowners. So it means we have to teach both. And yeah, it's a hell of a struggle. <laughs> so, so I guess I'm going to jump right into it and go, you know, so Nate's, Nate's ongoing, uh, ongoing series for us of late. I mean, it's been you, several years. I can't even remember how many years you've been in the magazine, probably three or plus, three plus because the years are now, flying yeah. by as I get grayer and uh, less uh, cohesive. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I know. You know, you know, Joe, you know, we don't know. We don't know with Joe. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're going to find out today. So it's let's, like, <laughs> let's, let's do it. So, so anyway, so Nate's been writing uh, of late a series called Badass HVAC. And he's coming up to part five of that. So, you know, I guess my first question, I guess he's got to, do you hate natural gas? <laughs> I don't know how else to put it, you know, because it seems like Nate, Nate, I, I will say those of you who haven't uh, read the articles in Healthy Indoors, first of all, you should read them. Uh, secondly, uh, there seems to be a preponderance of talking about electric. So. <laughs> yeah. Well, you, what do you mean? Like the sign behind me that says electrify everything? Um, Kinda. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And one of my clients uh, made that for me. And he's just about to electrify his house too, the new place that he just bought. So um, do I hate natural gas? Sort of. Um, uh, it's, it's mainly a pollution argument for me. Um, uh, you know, when we burn stuff, bad stuff goes in the air. And who knows how much is the stuff we have to burn. And the stuff that we're getting to right now oftentimes comes with other problems screwing up groundwater and so forth. But that's that's a whole nother piece of the puzzle that will just end up ticking people off one way or another. Uh, but when it comes to badass HVAC, so the, the system, it's, it's one system, the, the subtitle for it is nearly perfect HVAC uh, because it can provide really good air quality and really good comfort um, almost all the time. Not quite, but almost. And uh, it, to be able to do that, the, one of the hardest parts of being in climates uh, like, well, Joe was, the, Joe's now in Colorado and it's dry there, um, punk, you don't have to worry about humidity anymore. Um, uh, <laughs> but for all of us that are in uh, what Teddy Bear, um, uh, Ken Gehring of uh, Thermostore calls green grass climates, uh, it's where your, your grass stays green all summer, even if you don't water it basically east of the Mississippi, we have humidity in the summertime that we have to deal with and usually spring and fall. And that can cause all kinds of chemical problems, um, chemical interactions in the house. It causes mold, uh, dust mites propagate more, um, viruses, which we care about a little more than usual at the moment when you get to very high levels. Um, so being able to control 
that humidity requires on-demand dehumidification pretty much all year. And what we found was one of the easiest ways to provide that is with high-end heat pumps. It's specifically a carrier infinity model. Um, and then there's, there's a bunch of brands that are the same piece of equipment. Uh, but it has what's called reheat dehumidification. So it, the air conditioner runs, takes the heat and the humidity out, and then you run the strip heat or the backup heat um, uh, while the air conditioner is running and you add the heat back in. So you dry the air without cooling it. Um, and so that allows us to keep a house dry all the time without a separate dehumidifier. And you can only do that if you have a heat pump only system. You can't do it with a hybrid, with a furnace first. Because um, you can only add the heat after the air conditioner takes the heat out of the air. Um, so uh, let, with the furnace- let, let, the Let's, furnace go, to, wait, let's go to one fundamental. Yeah, let's explain one fundamental. Why don't yeah. you just explain the yeah. heat pump in that uh, uh, my yeah. version is it's a reverse air conditioner. So why don't you just explain the difference between a heat pump uh, or if I were to go outside, how would I know if I had a heat pump? Yeah. Looking at my system or, or in my, wherever my furnace is. I don't like what, what, what is a heat pump? What is what a is, furnace? Yeah. So yeah. yeah, it's, we have to take a couple of steps back because um, sure. technically an air conditioner is a heat pump because it pumps heat from one place to another. Um, the easiest version of a heat pump, uh, something that the HVAC version of a heat pump uh, in the U S anyway, the Australians call them reverse cycle air conditioners, um, which is not a bad way to do it either. Yeah, uh, sure. But uh, a, a heat pump can, can take heat out of cold air and pump it someplace else. So all of us have one of these in our house right now. It looks like the refrigerator. You don't think about it, but there's heat coming out of the back of the refrigerator. But inside the refrigerator is cold. So there is heat to be removed. Um, and so a, a heat pump for a house can take heat out of the cold outside air and pump it into your house just as in air conditioning mode, it takes heat from inside your house and pumps it outside, even though outside is warmer. Um, and hopefully that works a little bit as, a, as an explanation. But yeah, the key thing is a, a heat pump goes both ways. It, it can heat your house and cool your house. Okay, well done. So, so you, you, you know, you brought up that term uh, "badass HVAC," and that's the moniker you came up with. Uh, mm -hmm. um, why, you know, why, why that? And I know, you know, we ended up using that graphic um, when we put that out there and flash it up again. I, I love the donkey graphic; yeah. it's hilarious. Well, that was well. He came up with "badass, badass HVAC," and then uh, over on the creative side and healthy indoors, I, I was able to find this donkey in a classroom. I just it seemed to make sense. Here we are. It's stuck. Um, so, uh, yeah, the, the, the bad comes from what we call a big ass drop. Um, and uh, uh, in an HVAC system, the return drop is the part like we have basements here. Um, so our, our HVAC systems are almost always in basements. So where the, the duct drops down from the ceiling from all the return ducts and goes into uh, the furnace or air conditioner or whatever you have, um, that's called the return drop. So uh, we got used to putting the filters. So if you've got the drop like this, we put a big media filter horizontally uh, in that drop. And I posted a picture of one of those. And actually, I'm just writing this right now. That's the explanation is in the article that's about to come out. Perfect. Uh, I, I posted a picture of it. And uh, Michael Hausch, buddy of mine, is like, that's a big ass drop. <laughs> and it's stuck. So now it's a bad. So bads are good. Um, uh, and that's where that came from. And then it's like, all right, so there's all this stuff, you know, big ass fan, badass this, so forth. Like, so what can we get ass to stand for? <laughs> um, and uh, so you're now using it as an acronym. It is an acronym. Yes. Okay, I got this. I have um, to hear the whole thing. It's 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 big ass drop. And then I couldn't figure out what to make it stand for. So my buddy Eric Kaiser's like, how about air source system? Because it works best with an air source heat pump. Um, and bada bing, bada boom, badass HVAC. So. It does stand for something. It's not just me being obscene, but it's that too. Yeah, well, yeah, and the, the obscenity part again. You know, it's like we're okay with that at HVAC, or you know, and I, you know, and I healthy indoors, yeah. and we just we don't mind it. Well, it's it's HVAC contractors. I mean, it's are, are you expecting a bunch of choir boys? Um, like that's not how it works. Well, Joe's a little offended. I mean, I, I had to actually, you know, get, get him to come on the show today. Cause he was like, I don't know, you know, you're going to, you're going to put that graphic up there. Yeah, He's well, easily I mean, offended though. 
Yeah, right. <laughs> language, people. Language. Yeah. <laughs> We're going to see how many times in one show we can use the word ass. And we're, and we're already we're already on record for the uh, Healthy Indoor show. So it's uh, excellent. Well, it was funny because I, I first presented this down at uh, Brian Orr's uh, show. Um, uh, so it, it had like three names, but RTFM was the one that stuck. It was read the fabulous manual. Um, or maybe it's read the fantastic manual instead of the other thing that the F word could, uh, you know, F could stand for. Uh and so it was the RTFM conference, but Brian uh, really tries to, in, in public, keep the swears down. Uh, and I'm like, can I just call it badass HVAC for the presentation? Because I knew I was pushing my luck. And he's like, yeah, sure. Um, so it, 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 I think that's very unobtrusive, you know, and I've said much worse on camera and on stage. So I'm not going to. No. but uh, yeah it's, wait, but wait, it sticks my, it my, sticks my, hold on That's it. Okay. my role is to keep keep us moving so we're gonna, we could talk about bad words all day so <laughs> l- l- let's get into let's one get of my new bad, let's get a new bad word yeah right so automobiles okay so well i use a comparison a lot that i think more people care about their automobile sometimes in their own home we're very in tune. It does a lot of things for us. So, um, in fact, most people are on top of changing their oil more than they are changing their filters. There's a lot yeah. of things. So, I know you also have comparisons about car, the, the automobile in terms of comfort. So, why don't you give us some examples of how the, you know, analogy of the car and the what, home? Can you pull up? Um, let's start with slide eight. If you can pull that one up. So uh, I cannot it, share slides right now, Bob. Why can't? Uh, okay. You've you, you've it's turned off. But if you, uh, what? I, yeah, you turned off. I, I cannot share slides. Oh, okay. Well, we're going to fix that in one second here. All right. Well, uh, okay. So while you're figuring that out, I'll talk about what it is. So Please do. Um, every HVAC system should be able to provide six functions. Um, and there's multiple ways to get there. Um, the most important one is load matching. That's where the, the output of heat or cool matches what the house needs all the time. And that's best done if you are very aggressive on your sizing. Um, and then you have multiple stage equipment. So it can stage down to say 25% of full capacity, something like that. Uh, so load matching is really important. Good filtration is very important for just overall health in a house. Plus it keeps your system from getting clogged up. Um, it's funny. I got to go make sure that I'm putting these in the right order. Dehumidification, yeah, which we already talked about, and it's best done with a heat pump only system with reheat, uh, fresh air. Um, but particularly in the midst of this COVID thing, uh, like fresh air is becoming a, a, a bigger deal. Um, so you can do it with open windows, but that can be dangerous in much of the, the country, much of the time, because it's so humid outside that it causes other problems. Um, the fifth one is mixing. You want to be able to mix the house all the time, stir it like a vinaigrette. So if you have a room with a lot of carbon dioxide, uh, you'll knock that down to the levels of the rest of the house. That is interesting with COVID at the moment. And then humidification, uh, depending on your climate, uh, can be really useful too. Um, so it's load matching, filtration, dehumidification, fresh air, mixing, and humidification. Um, every system should be able to do those. Now, and most people are looking at, you're, yeah, you're thinking about your car. And so I have this control panel at the bottom there so I can adjust the heat. I can do max AC and I have uh, the ability to, to determine where the air comes from and uh, how uh, the velocity. So why don't you kind of uh, explain what are those th- that what, what, what can't the car do out, out of those ones you just uh, described? So it can do most of them, but it does not do one of those. Which one is that? Um, yeah, so the, the only one that a car can't do, a car can do five of six, and every car with air conditioning can do five of six. Um, so the only one that a car can't do is humidification, because you'd need a tank of water for it to add uh, moisture into the house. And uh, it's a, I don't want to put any more water or fluids into a car than I have to. There you go. Um, so th- this is out of HVAC 101, it's the uh, second chapter of my book, and our, our HVAC 2.0 beta contractors have found this immensely helpful to send out before they go to see a client, um, uh, because it helps people understand what the differences are. Like, the, 
when we first learn of any product, we tend to think that it's a commodity and there aren't a lot of differences. Uh, my favorite example is paint. I bought a $12 can of ceiling paint years ago for our second house. Three coats in, we hadn't finished covering. We were just doing white over white going from glossy uh, to uh, flat and it hadn't done it. And I put three coats on that ceiling. And I ran out of the twelve gallon, twelve dollar gallon, and had to go buy another gallon. I'm like, this is crap. So, it, whatever product you're looking at, there's different levels, different grades, and understanding what those are is important, um, and also understanding what the functions are is important. And uh, back to the car here, uh, cars have all kinds of variable speeds, all sorts of different things that you can play with, um, and we also understand all of these things intuitively. Uh, so, uh, like, if you look at the, um, well, if you if you get that one back up, but you think of on your car, or or an older one. I mean, now they just have you tell it what temperature, and then you get two sides so that you and your wife can actually be both relatively comfortable. Um, uh, but you you get a a dial of full hot or full cold, um, so you can you can match what the car needs because you first get into the car. There you go. And, you know, it's, it's really hot or it's really cold. So you're going to run the HVAC flat out for a while until it takes the edge off of uh, whatever the temperature is. But, you know, once you've been driving down the road for 15 or 20 minutes, you're not going to leave the heat or the air conditioner running full tilt. You're going to back it off. Um, so all cars can back it off. Almost no houses can. Houses have an on-off switch. It's do you want heat or do you want cool on-off? There's no in the middle. Um, Cars also have variable fan, so you can run it low and then it's not very noisy, or you can run it all the way high and you usually have to speak up to talk over it. Um, and then cars can also aim where you want that flow to go. So, you know, you can hit yourself in the face, you can put it on the defroster, you can send it to the floor or some mixture of all those. Um, there you go, there's the on off. So that's the load matching. Um, and the, the curse of houses is when it comes to load matching, uh, if you have an oversized furnace or an oversized air conditioner, you're going to blip the temperature up really quickly, and then it's going to slide down again, or vice versa if you're running air conditioning. Um, and uh, you, you, you really want a nice, stable, steady temperature in the house. You don't want it doing this. You want really steady. And unless you have a tightly sized uh, HVAC, you're not going to get that. Um, because it's it, it, even if it's running on low stage, it's still going to be um, heating or cooling the house too quickly. So let's expand on tightly sized. So let's talk about briefly. So there's, sure. you know, that, that we're talking about the, the, the unit itself that actually which moves the air. We're talking about ductwork. We're talking about the resistance of the filter and the, the design. So one of them I can try to upgrade. In fact, one of the reasons that people are doing this is because their system is dying or they yeah. think it's dying and now they're going to do an upgrade. So let's want you to describe briefly about here's some design considerations, which most people don't understand that as a concept, even some HVAC contractors don't like, yeah. I'm going to swap out this one with the same one. It's just newer and looks better. Um, so <laughs> explain the concept of a design versus just, you know, um, swap in a box. Well, do they actually do? I mean, for, first question, Joe, is actually, is it common for there to be a real mechanical design in a residential system or is it just equipment slapped in ductwork placed where it fits around everything? And, you know, uh, well, the, the it works. Required for a while. So, I mean, it's, you know, you're only supposed to drive the speed limit too, but that doesn't mean that people do what they're supposed to. So <laughs> I don't, uh, <laughs> the only time I'm below the speed limit is as I'm accelerating through it. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, um, so yeah, there's a couple different ways we can parse that. So design to me would be like the entire view of what you're going to do for the HVAC system for the house. So that's going to involve what, what's your filter going to be, uh, what size ducts are we going to hook it to? You know, there's a lot of other pieces. But if you look at the size of the equipment, that's really critical to understand. And um, there's one number that basically rules the sizing roost which is the blower door number. It's how much uh, air a house leaks. So if you don't have a blower door number, and I w I've watched these uh, load calcs and I've done these load calcs, 
So say you've got a 2000 square foot house and it's, uh, we're all kind of in the same climate, actually. I think we're all climate zone five at this point. Um, so say it's a 2000 square foot house and it's really leaky. That may actually need an 80,000 BTU furnace to keep that warm on a five degree day, which would be about where our design- I guess is the loss. Yeah, that's the loss. Yep. Um, and that happens to be kind of a mid-sized furnace. So furnaces are like uh, 60, 80, 100,000 is like the common sizes where heat pumps are in tons, which is 12,000 BTUs per ton. And it's, it's, it's how much heat it takes to melt a ton of ice over 24 hours. Because originally when air conditioners were developed, they were competing with ice. Um, and we still have a 120 year old metric. <laughs> <laughs> and, and they're to clarify they're in they're talking about cooling capacity and with the tonnage yeah well but it can be heating too right so um so i mean two and three ton heat pumps are your common ones so 24 and thirty six thousand. um so anyway leaky house 70 or eighty thousand btus is needed on that cold day uh, most houses when we test them we find that they need closer to forty thousand btus so they're in the three ton range mm -hmm. and if they are relatively tight um meaning say their blower door is about half, well, it's, it's fairly tight. It's it, say their blower door is half what their square footage is. So they have a thousand CFM 50 blower door test on a 2000 square foot house. Um, that house might only need two tons to keep it warm. Um, in fact, Bill Spohn's building one right now um, and he's putting a two ton heat pump on a 20, 2800 square foot house, something along those lines um, in, in Pittsburgh. Um, so, I mean, that's not the warmest climate in the world. Uh, and so the, the curse is, if you don't know the blower door, we're looking at between 24,000 and 80,000 as the right size piece of equipment for that. So it'd be like walking into the store and asking the clerk, so what size do I need? I don't know, small, medium, large XL, maybe a double X. Yeah, it's a big range. Um, yeah, it's, it's whatever, like just pick one. Um, uh, but instead of it being a, a $12 or a $50 shirt, it's a $10,000 piece of equipment that you can't return. Um, so once you make that choice, you're stuck with it for 15 or 20 years. Um, so if, if you do a blower door test and then you do a load calc that is true to that blower door and the energy use of the house, instead of being plus or minus 30 or 40,000 BTUs on your sizing, you're plus or minus three or four. Um, and with the you know, standard sizes being 12,000 BTU increments or 20,000 BTU increments, you know what size you need once you have that. Um, like it's, it's very so tight. Let's pause right now that most heating and cooling contractors, I, I, I leave out the V because they usually don't do the V. So they're heating and cooling contractors, sorry. Mm -hmm. And um, they don't have a blow door or, um, you know, or do that at all. They really uh, don't understand that infiltration can be up to 40% of their load, mm -hmm. meaning how much the, the capacity they need to install in your house. So yeah. you're now you're asking for your HVAC contractor, I accidentally put the V back in, to um, make sure they understand what infiltration really means in your house and yeah. do they have a blower door or have somebody who can come over and do a blower door test. So that's one caveat when you're looking for your list of stuff to talk to your contractor about. Do they have a blower door and know how to use it would be the question that I would be asking. And are they going to do duct leakage testing too? You know? Yeah. I mean, maybe not just a blower door. Maybe you should uh, bring a, some form of a duct blaster unit too. D depending duct where you are. Duct tester. Duck okay. tester. I know that's a brand, trade name. Oh, yeah. you're right. <laughs> <laughs> he's so politically correct. And he's not. That's the, that's the part that, but anyway, <laughs> carry on. Joe doesn't swear except for what he does. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, it's in the green room. He was swearing. Uh, <laughs> well, this whole thing is the green room really. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. True. Uh, but uh, um, so a couple of points there. Uh, so Duck testing is, to me, a secondary metric. So if you blower door test first, if you've got a pressure pan with you while you're doing a blower door test and you're, you're in a southern climate, so you've got the ductwork in the attic, you can test a couple of registers and get an idea if it's a train wreck mm. or not. Mm, um, right. And then decide, go, no, go. Do we need to do more testing? Um, but, uh, the, I mean, there's, there's two big issues here. A, homeowners have to be willing to ask for it and pay for it and B contractors need to have one. Um, and they really should have a good process to follow for doing that. Because if, if we are expecting everyone to be Michael Jordan level talent, uh, we're going to fail. And to me, that's the building performance world has expected that for years. And there's a reason that's, you know, it, it isn't growing 
um, and it, it's problematic. So, I mean, that's, that's where we have been creating the HVAC 2.0 process, which at least offers a blower door test to everyone, uh, every contractor that's using it. We don't expect everybody to take it, um, but at least it's offered. And if we can get to where healthy and comfortable homes are available to anyone that wants them, to me, that's, that's the big piece. Um, so yeah, but it, to you HVAC contractors out there watching, like it's not that hard to run a blower door. Um, if you're an HVAC contractor, you are mechanically oriented. I can teach you how to run one in an hour. Um, it's not that hard. And then you can go screw it up like I did um, because I had no idea what the hell I was doing when I first got one. And uh, I didn't turn my boiler off and uh -oh. had the blower door on, started walking down, go downstairs. And I see flames, 200,000 BTU shooting sideways out of my boiler. Um, that was, That's odd. <laughs> that was, that was no good. Um, I have never gone up those stairs that fast before or since. Uh, <laughs> um, but uh, as long as you remember to turn the equipment off, there's not that much you can screw up. Okay. On that note. So um um, uh, let's get back to um, what are the benefits of this designed system that you have your yeah. badass super duper heating and cooling system. So um, why should I feel suddenly when everybody says, Hey man, I got a badass car. It only makes me feel bad about what, what kind of car I've got. So I'm like, Oh yeah, well, you know, so well, that's part, that, but that's part of it. Yeah, that's right. That's right. So that let's, is, let's talk know, about some of the, why, why it the is shaming, that I need the public to say, shaming. Yeah. Because uh, of course the the, the heating and cooling contractor is going to show up and he's going to be like, oh yeah, man, we do badass all day, you know. But I'm like, well, is, is that what you do on the weekend, or are you installing, uh, you know, a, a good system? So let's clarify what is it that they're installing and how to get some uh, some technical stuff behind that. And many of them are bigger is better, right? I mean, that's still that that, that mantra yeah, is still right. out there, especially on the cooling side. Hey, you know, yeah, yeah. if one the ton's good, two tons got to be great. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah right. exactly. Uh, so if, if a lot is good, more is better. Um, Joe, can you pull up the slide that has uh, the picture of the system? Got it. So, I mean, it, it, the badass HVAC, it's, it, the whole point behind it was how do we create a fairly simple system that most contractors can hopefully sell, like they, they, they probably could use a hand, but most contractors can install for sure because it's not crazy complicated. It doesn't require a whole bunch of extra pieces of equipment. So that, note that there's no ERV, there's no ventilating dehumidifier, even though we're, we're fine with those pieces of equipment. Um, uh, but you know, it, if we're going to provide really good comfort and really good air quality, we need to control those six functions of HVAC. Uh, that I was talking about. And this is what it actually looks like in the, uh, in the field. So load matching is if you're going to be tightly sized, um, whenever you do a load calc and you're, you're truing it to actual energy use and you watch a few systems and see how they run, you're going to start using heat pumps because two and three ton heat pumps will cover a huge chunk of houses out there. Um, so that's I'll bring one back piece up. of it. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, there's a humidifier on there, which is really the only separate piece of equipment. Um, and that's not going to be right for every climate. That's why it's number six, um, as far as, uh, uh the, the priorities, uh, but the second one is filtration. So you see what that looks like. Um, the, the big ash drop note that the, the drop, so the, the humidifier in this instance is on the, uh, uh the return. So that's where the air is coming back into the system. So that's a really big filter. And what's nice about having that horizontal filter is, um, A, you've got it in this huge duct. So the entire face gets hit. And because it's horizontal rather than vertical, the, the whole face gets hit evenly. So it actually filters most of the garbage out and the filter gets dirty evenly, where if you put it after the turn, you're, you're gonna have one side or the other get dirtier faster. Um, so the filter works better. Plus with using this great big uh, drop, the filter drop across it is really minor. Uh, so like if, if you put in uh, you know, a, a strong, like a MERV 13 uh, one inch filter, it's gonna create all kinds of pressure where the, that air is just working hard to try and get through that thing. Um, where if you use a large filter um, in the drop and everything's big, uh, that air doesn't work hard to go through there. So we find that uh, we're getting less than 0.1 inch of water column 
uh, pressure drop across our filters. Routinely, we're in the 0 0.05, 0 0.06 range. Um, and the, the manufacturers may say 0.1, but if you actually go measure any of your media filters, because your drop is small, so there's not enough air and you're trying to make it turn and do all kinds of stuff, you're probably going to find that it's double that. Um, and the more pressure there is, um, the, the more energy your fan has to use and also the louder it gets. And also the sooner it will fail in some cases, like not, not all equipment, but if it's very high, you know, your, your fan, instead of lasting 10 or 15 years might last three. Cause I've seen that with a few clients. Are, are you specking like four inch filter, uh, thickness filters or six yeah. inch? I'm real, trying to get as much as you can get yeah, as whatever. much media. Um, f four is fine for what we're seeing thus far. Um, it's this whole thing is meant to be a concept for people to, to do what R and D really stands for, which is rip off and duplicate. So note that we're not trademarking this or doing anything like that. This is just an idea that we're putting out there because we want this to become normal because it's something most people can install. Most people can sell that will work in most homes that controls comfort and air quality really well. Most of the time, it's not perfect, but it's one fairly simple system that does a pretty good job. Um, and I mean, it's 85% of HVAC that's sold today is single stage and it is incapable of being badass because you can't do load matching. So the most important thing at the beginning, you can't do period off the table. Explain why that's the case though. Why is a single stage uh, limited in what it can do? Well, it's uh, like we were talking about earlier where your heat is on off or your cool is on off. Um, like it, if you are sizing your furnace for when it's five degrees outside, how often is it five degrees outside? I mean, in our climate, we're below five degrees on average, 88 hours a year. And so it's a couple hours here, a couple hours there. It's, it, we, we aren't there very much. So if you are sizing to that, um, that furnace is right sized for about 100 hours a year. But the other 8,600 hours a year, 8,700 hours a year, it's wrong. Um, so you're putting too much in. So you race that temperature up and then you pull it back down. So something a lot of people are probably used to is when it's say 50 degrees outside and you're like, man, my house is freezing. I don't know what's going on. It's because your furnace isn't running long enough to heat up the house. You have to heat up all the building materials in the house. Because I, ideally you want all of the building materials in the house to be within two or three degrees of what the thermostat says. And then your house will feel amazing. That's what we do for our clients. One client last year, it was awesome. She, she's like, Nate, I, f I feel like you put a whole bunch of invisible radiators in my house. Yeah, you should create radiant heat sinks all over. I mean, effectively, yeah. that's what you've got there. Yeah, yeah it's, it's awesome mean radiant temperature, um, which is all in chapter one of my book, free download. But let me catch one of the jargons that we just wrote, which was a single stage. And uh, to clarify that uh, newer units have the ability for a motor to run on either variable speed, which which means it can fluctuate depending on what your needs are, or uh, it, it actually has two stage, which says it's like high and low, like a gear uh, on a car, or single stage is it just runs. It's kind of like a, a bicycle with no gears. It's, it's all it can do is to do this one uh, speed. One gear. It's on so, all, the, all the way or off. Th there's, there's an important uh, distinction here. So there's output and there's fan, um, which are, are different. So you can have a multiple sure. st uh, stage fan on a system that's only on off. So say you have a 60,000 BTU furnace, your options are 60,000 BTUs or nothing. Um, it would be a little bit less because it's not 100% efficient, but say it's 56,000 BTUs or nothing. That's your option. Um, uh, and so, yeah, you could get a two stage and a two stage, a uh, low stage is usually about two thirds of full capacity. So it would be 60,000 and 40,000, something like that. Um, and the same thing goes for two-stage heat pumps and air conditioners. Uh, but ideally, if you want to step up into the fully modulating equipment that can vary in five stages or 100 stages, something like that, they'll step down to about a quarter of their full capacity. So now if we run a three-ton 36,000 BTU heat pump, it will step all the way down to 9,000. And instead of only being able to match what the house needs heat-wise, uh, for a few hours a year. Now we can match what it needs about half the year. And the other half that it isn't like it's 60 degrees outside. If it, it like, we're not that uncomfortable when it's 60 degrees outside, like it's like 60 to 75. That's kind of a sweet band. Uh, the windows open kind of area. Uh, but uh, it's, it's really critical to size things as tightly as possible, as small as possible so that all the pieces of your house are, about the same temperature and they're close to that thermostat 
um, and then also run multiple stage equipment that runs almost all the time, uh, which seems like it should use more energy, but it doesn't. Um, it's it's kind of like we probably did this as kids riding a bike, like you're going along and then you're like, I'm going to pedal like crazy, uh, like a little kid. And then you stop and, you're like, and, it, and now as adults, we know, let's just let's keep those pedals rolling. Uh, Long and steady. Too hard. Yeah, let's just keep going. Um, and so like you expend the same net amount of energy with both of those tactics. Um, but it's better to be slow and steady the whole time. And there's other benefits to that, right? This is not take it outside of the energy consumption by having the equipment running more, you know, a, a longer, longer duration, longer cycles, you're dealing with there's dehumidification issues and there's just indoor air quality, right? Filtration. Yeah. So elaborate on that. Yeah. I mean, it's, uh, so the, let's let's talk about filtration and just crap in the air um because uh you know hayward's looking at this and obviously uh, bob you've been dealing with this for years too um when you get the small particles in the air um so pm10 means particulate matter 10 microns and below um and a human hair is 50 to 70 microns so we're talking you know a fifth or a seventh of the yeah. uh, the size of a human hair when it's that size we inhale it when it gets down to uh, PM 2.5, it hits our lungs. And when it gets below one, it goes straight to bloodstream. Um, so, I mean, it's, I, I don't want to focus on COVID here, but uh, viral particles, even though they're usually smaller than even that, I mean, they're tiny oftentimes. They can be like 0.1 microns, but they're usually in spit particles. Of right. They're, they're attached to a larger um, particle droplet exactly. or something. And so if we can catch those particles, that is helping things out. Um, another very small particle would be diesel exhaust because uh, diesel exhaust contains a lot of heavy metals and they're heavy metals in like the 0.03 to 0.1 micron range. Like they are really, really little. Um, and, you know, heavy metals in our bodies. Is that a good thing? Um, you know, are we going to go back to working with mercury, you know, <laughs> the Mad Hatter, stuff like that? Like this is negative stuff. So if we can filter that. Um, which we can if you have a, a decent filter on a house, but you can only use that good filter um, and have it not cost a lot if it's a, a, a big media filter, like a four inch thick filter. Um, there we go. Thank you, Joe. Um, so, and then the other thing is a filter is only going to be doing its job if the fan is on and you're putting air through it. So you need to have a big filter and move enough air all the time that you're constantly knocking the garbage out of the air. Because if, if the filter doesn't knock the garbage out of the air, what does? The three of us. Well, uh, gravity. Gravity eventually, uh, in theory. Yeah, yeah, that's true. D depending on the particle size. Um, yeah, yeah the, you get under PM10 and well, it'll stay in the air for hours. So Wait, let's just not let gravity just stay that it captured anything. As all it do is put what, it down to the floor until you knock it right. back up. Yeah, right. until you resuspend it, yeah. Um, Which means that a lot of the ionizing uh, procedures just plate things out for the, a period of time until they lose charge and fly around again. <laughs> <laughs> I mean. Yep, uh, that's a... Uh, yeah, that's it. for for air. It's, let, let's just filter it. Let's not add anything to air aside from uh, moisture. That's that's my feeling. Um, or if somebody wants to do something different, let's see the papers on it. Um, so yeah, this this is a, a great slide, Joe. Thanks for putting this one up. So these are the four factors of air quality. Um, we need to be able to control moisture. We need to be able to control dust, which we're talking about right now, particulate matter. We need to be able to control chemicals. So the first thing is don't big bring bad crap into your house, but once it is in, um, and oftentimes it's in your building materials and your couch and things like that, you need to be able to deal with it. And that uh, combustion is the last big category because um, uh, there's all kinds of bad stuff. You know, it's it, uh, having been to India, um, holy cow, is their air screwed up. Um, in New Delhi, I couldn't see the sun. It was this glowing orb in the sky, but you couldn't directly see it. It was strange. It was like you know, being in an alien world or something like that. That's a bunch of crap from things being burned uh, primarily is what it is, which we've seen. I mean, the, one of the nice things about uh, COVID, one of the, the silver linings is we have seen what reduced pollution looks like. Um, you know, so there was an Indian city that like, it's the first time we've seen the Himalayas in 30 years. Um, LA, Wait, they so, can see clear for the yeah, first time. I, so I brought this up because I want to go through uh, the how to control some of these measures. So uh, dust is, we just talked about filtration, and that's also infiltration, which means how leaky your house is, is uh, also can control that. 
Um, but let's talk about some uh, ways to combat chemicals, which are in in the building materials and in the furniture and a variety of stuff that we have in our house that we, you can't eliminate. So Joe, I'm going to turn that question back on you, buddy. Um, okay. What do you think is uh, one of the best ways to control chemicals? Uh, yeah. So the best way to do to, for me is actually to kind of dilute that. So the, you can call it fresh air. It's a good term for um, uh, marketing, but it's really it's outdoor air. Hopefully it is fresh and you're filtering it as it comes in. So the more you're diluting the indoor air also makes the air much healthier, much fresher. And, and if you want to bring COVID into it, these, these are the things that we're now aware of as to why outdoor air into our house is a huge benefit um, for cognitive reasons and just uh, good health and diminish all the other stuff that we decided we wanted to live with and can't live without. So um, <laughs> so how about moisture? I'll send you off in moisture and I'll bring up a slide for you. Thank you. Yeah, because uh, it's uh, fresh air is definitely a piece of the puzzle. Um, uh, but moisture control is also huge. Um, yeah, if you have that slide of uh, like the, the ashray with all the, uh, the wedges and so forth, that's probably the best one. Um, but uh, like chemical pollutants, when you get to higher levels of uh, humidity, everything off gases more. And we all kind of noticed this, uh, like it, this just happened for us the other day, actually. So um, I bought an Oriental rug before my wife and I got together and she has never liked it. Um, and we had it down and our, uh, uh, our old cat peed all over the thing. And so it lived in the garage for like 10 years. And we moved here. I'm like, I want to put this down in my office. Um, really? But, but it reeks. So I took it in to get cleaned. Um, and I got it back. I'm like, it still smells a little bit funky. Uh, so I'll just set it here and maybe it'll air out. Well, we just got to higher humidity levels a couple of days ago. And my daughter's mm -hmm. room where I had thrown the thing was just reeking of cat pee. And we don't have a cat anymore. Um, uh, and I'm like, ah, crap. But that is VOCs off gassing. Um, you know, when, when you add moisture to chemicals, you start to smell things that you didn't otherwise. Um, and a lot of these chemicals we can't smell anyway. Uh, like you need an air quality monitor to detect uh, chemical pollutants in the air. But if you can hold the humidity levels down, you will also largely hold the VOCs in check. You, you need to dilute them and you need to not bring them in. But once they're in, holding your humidity levels is one of the best ways to do it. Yeah, formaldehyde is a hydrophilic, which means that the more moisture, the more it wants to now exchange itself with the environment. So that's definitely something you want to be cautious of. Formaldehyde is in so many things we live with, but again, less less moisture is better for multiple levels. Um, there are some challenges now with what people say about too too low of moisture. So I'm I'm not gonna. Uh, deviate uh, there. I'll bring this chart back yeah. up one more time. I have a different philosophy on this chart because uh, Ashray had an older version of this, which went down to 30. Um, yes, and me too. Uh, where, yeah, where I live, um, it, it's rare to get that. I, so I'm, I'm in a dry climate. So I live in Arizona. I also live in Colorado and it's rare to have you know, moisture sometimes above 20. Um, so I yeah. think that 30 is a good level to achieve and above 60 has a variety of challenges. Yeah. So that's, that's an important point because we, we disagree with this too. We think 30 to 50 is the place to land uh, or um, uh, it's a uh, shoot. My mind's blanking. Um, uh, Robert Bean. Um, he says 35 to 55 plus or minus 5%. That to me is a, a pretty good thing. Um, yeah. Because uh, you, you really don't want to hit 60 if you can avoid it. Because I mean, you, you look at the, the wedges there, the action starts at about 60% relative humidity. Um, uh, but you don't want to get super low either. Um, so what we recommend is in the winter to try and stay in the 30 to 40 range and in the summer, try to stay in the 40 to 50. Um, that's, it, it, does that sound about fair to you guys? Cause you guys are, yeah, that, that makes, that makes total sense. And I think that's, you know, those are the numbers you, you probably should be shooting for. One of the exceptions I've always taken to some of the, uh, some of the extrapolations that people do with ash rays, you know, obviously when you get above 70% relative humidity for an extended period, you're really driving microbial growth. Right. I mean, yeah. no, no question about it, but I think there's this, this inaccurate, uh, you know, reverse assessment that if you stay below 60%, you can't have mold growth in the indoor environment. And that's just total nonsense because remember it's not growing in the air it's growing on surfaces and you still could have uh, condensing planes at very very low relative humidities you can be 25 percent relative humidity in a building in cold weather and you could have liquid water you know in a wall detail inside the wall exactly yeah, yeah it's a um, i mean what i tell our clients is watch your windows 
if you ever see condensation in uh, like on the inside of your windows, there's condensation somewhere else that you can't see that's probably growing something that you don't want. Um, so again, humidity control is critical and that's like badass what was put together. I mean, th this is what we install in client homes. We didn't call it this until, I don't know, six months ago or so when, you know, it's like, all right, so we got bad. How do we make it badass? Uh, like we were talking about earlier. Um, this is what we've done. And uh, I've been a big fan of uh, the low cost air quality monitors for years. You know, so I wrote the first substantive comparative review between, uh, uh, between them. Um, and in watching those with our client homes with this specific system in, their air quality is not perfect, but it's pretty good. And it's fairly automatic because there, there is no way to right now, there, there may be, but there's no way to automatically control air quality. There's no system residentially that if you hit a certain trigger, it will, you know, crank up the air handler right. or turn on the ERV to hire. Like there's, there's no good way to do it. There's a few IFTTT kind of things, but there's nothing integrated. There's nothing that's non-geeky. You think there will be though? I, I see that on the near horizon. I mean, the, it is. Yeah. The, market, well, Haven, the market's we'll, driving we'll that. Um, well, to some degree. So Zoa Haven's coming out with it. We'll, we'll see if there is enough market for it because I'm, I'm not completely convinced, but I hope there is because um, it would be nice to have. Um, well, I know the Panasonic and both Brone have disclosed that they have systems that will be uh, released with, uh, they've been delayed due to obvious issues, but the uh, early next year, they will be releasing an integrated system in your house. Um, yeah, some but, work with and without your HVAC system, but it is a ventilation strategy. So, yeah. It's a strategy, but that's, that's, that's controlling bath fans and maybe the ERV. Um, we, we need to bring the central system in, I think, for it to really work well. Like we need to work that central filter hard. Uh, we need well, to, part of it's the technology there. sensing and, and yeah. the higher end technology is becoming much more affordable. I mean, you're going to have real particle counters and real, you know, photos, uh, uh, yeah. uh, you know, ionization detectors that can actually do real VOC instead of just some electrochemical sensors, you know, so, and we're not far from having those things dropping in that 600, $700 range with real high end stuff that used to cost seven, $8,000. It's close. It's, it's definitely moving. Um, Definitely. I, um, I want to address something that's a common myth. So why don't you, uh, you, you tell us where you live and what your what, what kind of climate you have and uh, how many people, like you mentioned, Bill Spohn of True Tech Tools, are, are, are all going this route, even if they're in a very cold climate. Yep. Uh, so good, good point. Um, th this is actually a, a picture from uh, my partner, Ted Kidd. This is his mom's house. Um, uh, so this is, I don't know, 10 years ago, 12 years ago, thereabouts. Um, it's a hybrid system. So it's uh, the, the, the current, the, the top of the line system at that time, the top of the line heat pump on top of a modulating furnace. And uh, she called Ted on a cold day. It was five degrees out. You know, Teddy, like it's, everything's fine, but the, it's cold air coming out of my vents. Like, even though the house is warm, like it just feels weird. What's going on? And he's like, they didn't tell if the furnace existed when they commissioned the thermostat. Um, so that, that house was running, it was a 3000 square foot house that was running on a three ton heat pump in Rochester, New York, um, which is not the warmest climate. Uh, you know, Bob, you're, you're not far from there. I'm just um, an hour away. Yep. <laughs> yep. And I'm about four hours from there and basically the same climate. Um, and you know, Denver, Colorado is a similar, uh, amount of heating degree days too. So similar climate. Um, so he's like, well, why the hell do we need a furnace? <laughs> Um, if the heat pump will carry it and the operating cost is similar uh, because my mom uh, i went to their house his mom sadly passed uh, a couple of years ago um but I, I at least got to meet her and i went to their house and i'm like this place is phenomenal like it's just perfectly comfortable everything's even everywhere and he was like yeah so why do we actually need a furnace um if the heat pump will do the job and it does a better job um and that's when it, it was a, little, a couple of years later we started working together and um, we started putting these heat pumps in. And then we watched that we had humidity issues because we're tightening these older homes that don't have a, a vapor barrier under the basement floor and they're getting damp. And I'm like, crap, how do we control this? Uh, and I'd seen reheat in there and started uh, trying to figure out what reheat dehumidification was, called the supply house to s learn how to turn it on. They're like, what's reheat? <laughs> <laughs> crap <laughs> and there's nobody else i can talk to i mean the, the carrier support bites um it's awful 
if you are running like right at the edge of what the stuff is capable of. So that was actually the, the, the first conversation Brian Orr and I had. Um, I was like, all right, I've got this turned on. What else do I have to do to make it work? And that did. So now we have these houses that are super comfortable for our clients using heat pumps in a cold climate. And we have really good humidity control and we have really good filtration and we have a simple fresh air system where it's just a duct going to outdoors. Um, there's, there's all these pieces of the puzzle that are all together in one piece of equipment. And with 15 minutes of punching buttons after the system's put on, I can configure all the stuff and the things, you know, good until it gets ripped out. Uh, so, and yeah, Joe, this is a important thing. We were kind of touching on this earlier. This is reheat dehumidification. So the first coil there is your air conditioner. Um, so that's knocking the, the heat and the humidity out of air. Um, but then you've got cold, dry air. And you don't want to put that back in the house. So like the challenging condition that almost every climate has three months or so a year of is when it's 70 or 75 degrees outside. But the dew point, so it's very humid. So the dew point is pushing 70 as well. So there's almost no cooling load but there's a whole lot of dehumidification that needs to get done. Um, and if we're you don't address that. Right yeah, we're, that? In that we're actually in that season for a lot of areas right now. Yeah, that yeah the whole East Coast is there. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, we're starting to head there. Even in Syracuse, it's actually gotten warm enough. There's sun again. It's back. <laughs> it snowed uh, two weeks ago. So That's a, no more negative thoughts for the <laughs> It's hard, you know. I know, right? Yeah, our winters are long. <laughs> February, March, every year, it's like, why do I live here? Um, and then you get the summer, you're like, oh, this is it. Um, but uh, anyway, so it, you, have, you need to have a way to knock humidity out of the air inside of a house without cooling it. Because almost every climate on the eastern side of the U.S. has three or four months a year of that. Um, you get to where it's hot and the air conditioner is going to run enough to keep the house dry. But it's those shoulder seasons where things get smelly, like my rug starting to smell. Um, if we don't have control over those, it's going to be problematic. And if you look back at the weather records, um, there's a, uh, I forget the name of the website now, but I, I did a whole presentation at the Healthy Building Summit called the Coming Mold Explosion. Our dew points, the amount of humidity in our uh, climates is up like two, three, four, five degrees on average, going back over where it was 50 years ago. Mm -hmm. Things are shifting. Yeah, no yeah question. things are moving. So we have more humidity we need to control. But then if you put in a high end piece of HVAC um, that is supposed to be very efficient, part of how they get that efficiency is a gain. So they run the, the temperature of the coil inside of it higher. So instead of an old unit, an old air conditioner running the coil at like 37 degrees where it, it basically acts as a sponge. So however cold the coil is, if there's more humidity, um, if the dew point of the air is above the coil temperature, it's going to suck that moisture out. And I know this is kind of technical, but it's how it works. Um, but the, the colder the air conditioner is inside your house, the better it dehumidifies. And the old stuff was just a sponge. Um, they just, they, they almost froze those coils all the time. Um, but now with the higher efficiency stuff, we're running 50, 55, maybe even a 60 degree coil. And so there's almost no dehumidification being done. So you put a, uh, a new air conditioner that is more efficient, but it doesn't do a good job dehumidifying. So the house gets damper, our dew points are rising, um, the trees over that house are growing, so it's mm -hmm. now more shaded than it used to be. Um, and you're, you're, it's a recipe for disaster. Um, I mean, it, it just is. Um, it, yeah. so a lot of my friends are saying they're getting all kinds of mold calls they never got. And it's been driven, you know, again, it's been driven by trying to increase those SEER ratings and, you know, and make these, make these units energy efficient, which they've done, right? They, I mean, yeah. these, the newer breed of air conditioners are much, much better at not spending uh, uh, cost, uh, energy consumption, but they don't do a very good dehumidification job at all. Well, people bring in fresh air right into their system is, is what they think. Oh, yeah, I can bring fresh air directly into my system, not realizing the amount of moisture that hits a cold surface and, you know, yeah. it's a mold, it's a, yeah, it's a mold the factory right there and the thing is that's a factor that you know it's it's funny like down in the southeast you know in the gulf areas it, it, they're they're more conscious of the fact that you know you've got a lot of latent latent load in, in those climates it's hard to bring outside air in but there's this misconception i think in the north right where, where we are nate that you know oh you, you know you don't really have a moisture issue to deal with well yeah we do from about late may until august end of august we we, we act 
like a, almost like a Gulf Coast area for a yeah. period of time. We get a lot of humidity here. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, even through October. I mean, yeah, we can't handle it. Degree dew points into October. Um, yeah. So, so we're we're starting to run out of time here. But I, I, this question I had to ask because, um, so you're saying that the typical heat pump systems that you're looking at are probably a three ton. That's like that's a size that kind of fits in. If there was if there was a size that fits many or not, I'm going to say all, not maybe most or many, that would be a three ton. So, what type of what type of cost difference are we looking at for somebody going with that type of uh, mechanical configuration over, say, a conventional single stage or even a multi stage system? What, yeah. What's the what's the difference in retail on this? Typically, and, uh, so if, if you're looking for a good professional install of uh, a furnace and an air conditioner, standard single stage, you know, maybe reasonably efficient, you know, decent piece of equipment, not bottom of the barrel, you're looking at probably six or eight thousand for the the thing. And it's going to depend. Like in California, it's twenty five thousand. Um, wow. <laughs> <laughs> it's like I don't know what it is with the costs out there. It's like everything's triple or quadruple. Um, but uh, you know, six or eight thousand for a lot of the country is where you are. Where if you want to step up into like a badass system, you're going to be somewhere between say 10 and 15, you know, it's going to depend. Um, but you're talking about a push of a couple thousand to maybe doubling the cost, you know, it depends, it, it depends on a bunch of things. Like, are there a whole bunch of duct adjustments that need to be done at the same time? Uh, do they have to run a new electric line? Uh, if you're doing a heat pump, so you, you got to run yeah, and maybe it's hard to get the electric line there. Yeah. Maybe uh, only had 110 wired to it before right yeah, and, uh, yeah. It's yeah. A, well yeah. even if it's 220 it's going to be a 30 it's like enough yeah it's like we yeah. enough amperage and if you want 15 yeah. kw backup you need basically 100 amps um so you need a big fat wire uh but yeah those are it's it's the incremental cost so are you going to get heating and cooling for six or eight thousand yes but if you spend incrementally not that much more you get an amazing house and a really good system um that likely has good longevity uh and will keep you comfortable for years to come how about operational payback are we, you know are our consumers looking at uh, you know any, any appreciable difference in operating costs and, and um yeah. eh, so if if you're going so here we have incredibly cheap gas um it's 35 cents a therm for the gas here um when you put in the meter fees and all the other stuff it ends up being like 70 cents give or take um so what we find is heat pumps versus gas are within a couple hundred bucks a year cost wise. If we can get rid of the gas meter, the, the meter fee here is 30 bucks a month. So it's 350 bucks a year, 360 bucks a year. That oftentimes brings the co the operating costs the same. Um, but at the end of the day, the operating costs don't matter that much because uh, our, our clients are like, I can't believe how comfortable my house is and my bills didn't go up. Um, that's all I care about. Or yeah, yeah. Go up a little bit. They don't care. Um, like, yeah, it's it, my bill went up 200 bucks a year. How many people are going to notice 200 bucks a year? I, I don't think, I think it's a negligible amount of money. If you have a comf more comfortable environment and you, yeah. and you know, and obviously a healthier environment, if you're controlling humidity better. So that's a good thing. Joe's Joe, you always have a closing uh, question here. So, yeah. So um, what's the number one thing you would tell your mom to do if she had to replace her unit and you could not do it or be there. So what, what's the one thing you want to make sure your, your mom would know, you know, mom, please don't ever forget when, if you have to replace your unit, this is what you need to do. Uh, get a blower door test and get a good load calc um, so that you put in the right piece of equipment. And that may actually be on the table. Uh, oddly enough, later tonight, I get to swap her thermostat out. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Literally. That's, that's yeah, good yeah. advice. Um, well, we, we have run out of time. I hate to say um we could go on forever but we'll have to have you back so that we can have more time with you um we'll do happy to so yeah yeah so uh the uh we're showing the march issue that was a cool and that was when we started our uh covid19 coverage uh the next edition of healthy indoors the may edition drops monday on the 25th um and uh we're anticipating having a uh, badass hvac part five in that one yep i'll have it to you <laughs> <laughs> so so uh, look look for that at healthyindoors.com uh the beginning of next week um looking forward to it and if you haven't and if you hadn't had the opportunity oh well of course joe's going to do the plug for healthy indoors so let's go with it uh so healthyindoors.com is where all of our stuff resides everything's at healthyindoors.com so we, uh our homepage is uh really the central clearinghouse for 
tons of useful information, whether you're a consumer or you're an industry professional. Um, you can get all the back issues of Healthy Indoors magazine. Uh, we got approximately seven years of that stuff sitting there uh, available, and it's all free, um, as well as uh, all the back uh, episodes of the Healthy Indoors show, the podcast, videos, blah, 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 blah. You know, and all uh, four previous uh Editions, I guess I would say episodes or uh, whatever, uh, incarnations of Nate's uh, Badass HVAC, parts one through four are already there published, so you can catch them, I think, all running since December, right? Or cause I think you missed one month in there somewhere? Yeah, yeah. It might have started in December. Well, anyway, yeah. just flip back through, you can get it. <laughs> it's all there, <laughs> somewhere. <laughs> I, so uh, as, uh, since we have time, I will keep pushing us. So um, uh, I represent uh, Hayward Score. We encourage you to go to HaywardScore.com and get you, and learn more about your home and uh, how to improve the health of your home and uh, feel more comfortable. And um, we have great individual um, uh, action items for you to do. Um, the other feedback I've got for you, Bob, is having a lot of people who said that they listen to the podcast. They can't watch it, but they're listening to the podcast. So all of these recordings are converted to podcasts if you want to listen to them and you can't sit and watch our faces. In fact, maybe that's a better choice for some. It of you might be. Really just it might be. Um, yeah. So, and remember, Hayward Score is actually a free uh, rating tool that you can, you know, go to HaywardScore.com, right? That's where you get it. That's right. Mm -hmm. And so that that's free as healthy indoors magazine, all this free, free, free. We're selling you nothing. You know, it's like, it's amazing. Uh, it's like, have you ever seen an infomercial where they're selling you free stuff? <laughs> Here it is. Here it is. But if you act, wait, but if you act right now, <laughs> if you, act now you can get it. more double. free. Yeah. <laughs> but, and the podcast, I, yeah, I, I've been looking at the metrics and I've actually been surprised uh, because I, this is something I've threatened since 2012 to my wife, I was going to start a podcast because I figured I've got sort of a radio voice. I could do one. And uh, it, it took literally seven years to finally get one. And we got it because we started the video show and well, let's, let's make an MP3 of that show and throw it out there. Uh, the first, Several weeks of the show, by the way, the podcast had video podcast too. We had video and audio. We stopped putting uh, the video ones up on the podcast because I don't think there's a lot of value in having it there. And it's just, we're, we want to get it up on Spotify and Spotify won't take mixed uh, mixed format. So that's one of the reasons. So if those of you are wondering why we no longer have a video podcast up there, um, that's pretty much why. Both of you, you, both of you who were thinking that, that we yeah, just all two question, of you. Right? <laughs> yeah. So you can go to YouTube though and watch them, right? We're on, yes, uh, the Healthy Indoors YouTube channels. They're, well, healthyindoors.com. They're all on healthyindoors.com because right. yeah. they're all Vimeo recordings too. So, um, and again, that's not an absolute either because, uh, I, you know, iTunes does uh, stream video. So we're, we're, we may put them back up there. It's, it's this, this balancing act of all the social media out there and media outlets trying to get the right mix. So uh, we're working on it. So with that, um, I really want to thank Nate for joining us this week. I think that was very informative and I can definitely see why we have to have you back to continue the discussions. Uh, Joe, of course, always, uh, always a pleasure having you here. You know, your, your warm and uh, charming, uh, you know, demeanor. Be nice. And, and, and no, I, I, no left, I let it go. I let it. No, I did. No, God God's sakes, man. It's like, I don't always there, say it, bad it, things. <laughs> I really don't, you know, it's like, I, what do you think of Joe Steverick? Come on, let's stop it. Anyway. Um, sorry, Joe, if you were watching, uh, any, anyway, uh, with that, I, I guess, I guess it's time to sign out. So I've, I've beat this horse far enough. Um, so for the healthy indoors show and healthy indoors magazine, I'm Bob Krell. Uh, we'll see you guys next Thursday from one to 2 PM Eastern daylight time for the uh, next episode of the healthy indoors show until that time, please stay safe.